All right, so um, guys, today what we're gonna do is we're gonna get into oxidation reduction reactions. Um, this, this is the way today's gonna play out. It really is that fast. Um, guys, I know I've shared this concept with you before, but literally we're gonna, we're gonna look at this at 30,000 feet. We're gonna be way up high. We're gonna get just enough of this that we can think through for the rest of the year, the little bit that you need to know about oxidation reduction. Then when we uh, hit chapter 20, which will be the last chapter of the last unit of the year, then we'll get into this in greater detail. So we will be done early. Um, if you play your cards right, you may be able to get your homework done and then you won't have homework over the long weekend. You can thank me later. Um, then guys, when we come back Wednesday, we'll grade this, we'll look quickly at titration and then your test is Friday. While you guys are working on your homework today, I'm going to hand back all of this graded work that I've got for you. So that's the plan for today. So guys, today what we're gonna do obviously is we're gonna talk about oxidation reduction reactions or, uh, you may as well just get accustomed to this. Typically, well, typically you'll never hear a chemist talk about oxidation reduction reactions. What we do is we take the reed and the ox and we call these redox reactions. Now guys, the reason that that's appropriate to crunch these down and this is going to become important and obvious in a minute, you can't have one without the other. Guys, you can't have oxidation without reduction and, and, and vice versa. If you've got one, you've got both. The trick is to figure out which is which, but you can't have one without the other. So guys, let's start talking about what these terms mean. So when you get into this again in chapter 20, this is going to be challenging um, because it's hard to keep track of the terms you're gonna find out that quick well, actually at first you're gonna be translating in your brain. You're gonna go, okay, oxidation means the loss of electrons. When something loses electrons, its charge becomes more positive and you're gonna go through all of this stuff. You're gonna find out quickly, you're gonna be able to just look at something and go, that got oxidized. You're gonna get good at this. Um, for now, you're gonna translate. So guys, oxidation means the loss of electrons as I just murmured, when something loses electrons, its charge becomes more positive. Now guys, conversely, when we talk about reduction, as we've already established, you can't have one without the other. So when we talk about reduction, we're obviously talking about a gaining of electrons. And when we talk about a gaining of electrons, the charge becomes more negative. All right, so guys, here comes your little history lesson. You ready? They first identified oxidation reduction reactions about 200 years ago. Um, so the question is, why the names? Why do we call the loss of electrons oxidation? Why do we call the gaining of electrons reduction? Well, guys, let's talk about oxidation first. Why did they call it oxidation? Because oxygen, actually, I couldn't have said that better, because oxygen is a good oxidizer. So guys, let's talk about why. Um, because actually, it's not the best oxidizer. There are better, but let's talk about why oxygen's good at it. So guys, let's think about it this way. Oxidation means the loss of electrons, right? So oxygen is really good at oxidizing other substances. That means taking electrons away from other substances. Why? If you look at oxygen on the periodic table, why would oxygen be good at taking electrons from other atoms? It's very electronegative. It's small, which makes it very electronegative. What else? And not because it bonds to itself, because when it's bonded to itself, it can't steal electrons from other things. Say it again. How many? How many valence electrons does oxygen have? 
One, two, three, four, five, six. So how many empty spaces does it have? Two. Two. Guys, that's what makes oxygen a really good oxidizing agent. Stealing electrons from other things is because it's really electronegative and it's got space for two electrons. So what they found was they started studying the way oxygen attacks other elements specifically metals. And what oxygen will do is it'll come and it'll steal electrons from these metals, thereby oxidizing them. And because they found that many times in nature when metals lose electrons, they lose them to oxygen, because there's a lot of oxygen in the air, they said, let's just call this oxidation. You understand, we have a different name for it, right? Rusting. Guys, that's all rust is, is when oxygen attacks a metal and steals electrons from it, you're then forming the oxide of that metal, which we call rust. Do you get the idea? Okay, so guys, that's where oxidation comes from. Why reduction? Why do they call the gaining of electrons reduction? Because the charge is going down. It turns out that when a substance is reduced, its charge goes down, and so they call it reduction. So you need to memorize these two ideas. This is the way I do it. I don't know why this just sort of clicks in my brain. The charge of the particle being reduced is reduced. Did any of you go to the BYU summer or the University of Utah summer programs in chem this year? Which one did you go to, BYU? You were at the U. Did they teach you oil rig? Yeah. yeah. So guys, apparently at the U they like oil rig. Ready? Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Oil rig? Uh, that's what you get when you go to the U. You get oil rig. Okay, so now guys, let's bring this together. You understand on some level that oxidation is losing electrons, reduction is gaining electrons. But again, guys, we started by saying you can't have one without the other. If something is oxidized, losing electrons, they've got to go somewhere. And the place they go is being reduced. So when we bring these together, we end up with what are called redox reactions. Now guys, when we talk about redox reactions, these are reactions in which electrons are being, ex or, yeah, where electrons are being exchanged. Yeah. And we'll look at examples in a minute. So guys, here's the tricky bit. We can't see electrons, right? So what, while well, you're still writing, it's important you hear this, I'll wait. This is kind of my happy place right here. I just get to sit and wait. You guys all caught up? So guys, redox reactions, the thing being oxidized loses, the thing being reduced gains. But again, the problem is, is we can't see electrons. So what? external evidence will we see when a redox reaction takes place? Something is changing. What will that thing be? The charges. Guys, when we're looking for redox reactions, what we're really doing to figure out what's going on with electrons is we're looking for changes in charge. The thing being oxidized, its charge will go up. The thing being reduced, again, makes sense, its charge will go down. So guys, what we need to do now is we need to figure out how to assign charges to atoms. So the next slide, I'm going to give you all the rules, then we'll play with it a little bit, then we'll look at a couple specific examples, and we're done for today. Go ahead. When you say the charge goes down, mm -hmm. you just mean it's becoming negative? No, because if it starts positive, it could just become less positive.
So if you have like manganese with a charge of plus seven and it's reduced, it could go down to plus six. Okay, it's still it's positive, but it's going down. Okay. Yep. Does that make sense? Okay. So guys, here are the rules. Write them down. Rule number one. All atoms in their elemental forms have an oxidation number of zero. And guys, I'll just tell you right now, some of these aren't going to make any sense, but they will in a minute. Rule number two. Rule number two. Write it down and then we'll talk about it. Rule number two, for a monatomic ion, the oxidation number equals the charge of the ion. y'all get it written down? You're okay? Okay, so guys, relative to this second rule, if I didn't put this on the board, you'd actually be just fine. Because all along, we've been pretending like this is true. The only reason that I put this on the board is because then when you go to college and you tell your professors that charges and oxidation numbers are the same thing, they'll tell you, no, they're not, because technically that's correct. But we've always been treating them as the same. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about. So guys, when you look, for example, let's just take sodium. When you look at sodium, you'll notice that there's that little number one up above there, right? What does that number tell you? It tells you the oxidation number, but what does it tell us? The charge, the number of electrons that sodium will lose. So if you want to write down, just to so you sort of understand what we're talking about, on the periodic table, guys, sodium's got a little one above it. And if you look at the secret decoder key on your periodic table, you will see that what that is, is the, the oxidation number. And guys, technically what that means, an oxidation number is technically the number of electrons that an element shares. But sodium typically doesn't share electrons, it loses electrons. So what we take from that is we say sodium likes to go one plus because it likes to lose one electron. Guys, these technically are not saying the same thing. When we say sodium has an oxidation number of one, that technically doesn't mean that it wants to lose one electron. It means it wants to share one electron because oxidation numbers are technically sharing numbers. We've just always treated them as the same. So bottom line is you have always thought that these little numbers mean how many they lose. Technically, they mean how many they share and we just treat them the same. So basically nothing's different, just that's the deal. Okay, so now guys, number three. Non-metals usually have a negative oxidation number. So the non-metals are the ones on the right. And if you look at their oxidation numbers on, on the periodic table, a lot of them have pluses and minuses. Plus one, plus three, minus three, plus four, plus five, minus two. They've got all these weird groupings of oxidation numbers. Guys, typically the nonmetals like to go negative. Rule number four, hydrogen can go either way. If hydrogen is bonded to a nonmetal, it'll be positive. If hydrogen is bonded to a metal, it'll be negative. But that makes sense, right? Metals like to be positive, so hydrogen will go negative. Nonmetals like to be negative, so hydrogen will go positive, because it can go either way. Okay, then guys, um, go ahead, Emma. Yeah, good for you. So yeah, and even on the AP test, 
they don't care. Um, you'll get college professors that are super hung up on this. Um, but for and the AP test, it doesn't matter. But let me show you the difference. This and this don't mean the same thing. The difference is this. This means sodium lost an electron and took on a one plus charge, a plus one charge. This means sodium shared one electron. So if the number's first, it's a charge. If the sign is first, it's a share. We treat them the same, but technically, when we're talking about salts, it should be charge and then number. Is that in the book? Wow. I didn't even know that was there. Okay, then guys, two more rules. The sum of the oxidation numbers for all of the elements in a compound is zero. And then the sum of the oxidation numbers for all the atoms in a polyatomic is the charge of the ion. And that means absolutely nothing to you, but we're going to play with some examples and then it'll make great sense. You guys okay? Not yet? How about now? You guys good? All right. Let's look at some examples. So guys, again, why do we care about the charges of atoms? We care about the charges of atoms because we're going to look for those charges changing because that's the evidence that we have of oxidation reduction taking place. But of course, in order for us to be able to see the charges change, we've got to know what the charges are. Okay, so guys, let's, let's, let's start simple. H2O, let's figure out the charges or the oxidation numbers, the charges for the atoms in H2O. So guys, we run into a problem because hydrogen can be positive or negative, but what does our rule tell us? When it's bonded to a non-metal, it will be positive. So now we can go over to oxygen and we can go, okay, oxygen is, is the non-metal and we find its charge and it's minus two and then hydrogen goes plus one, and two plus ones balances a minus two, and those would be the oxidation numbers for water. Does that make sense? You okay? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, and for this we don't care, shared or stolen, we just need numbers. So you could write them either way. You okay? Okay, really? Go ahead. No, no. No, no. With the good question. With the salts, they do. Salt will always be positive first, negative second, but this is a molecule, so it could be either one. Is that okay? Okay, so guys, let's do this one. Well, let's just keep it simple. Sodium chloride. We don't even need to look, right? What's sodium? Plus one, chloride, minus one. Okay. What about this? Sodium nitrate. Okay, so let's think through this. Nit nitrate's a polyatomic. So now this gets a little more complicated. So guys, now we need to draw on those rules that are at the end of this. And I'm gonna switch colors and we're gonna kind of tear this one apart. So guys, we know that this is a salt and we treat it as a positive and a negative species, okay? Now, we have a rule that says the positives and the negatives have, have got to balance. That's the first to last rule that says the overall charge is zero. 
So guys, we understand that sodium's plus one. What's nitrate? Minus one. But I like, I mean, I don't even write it down because I do a lot of this. But the idea, guys, is that nitrate's minus one. So you know what? Maybe a better place to write that is down here. Nitrate's minus one. But what then is the charge of the nitrogen and the oxygen? Well, guys, we know that oxygen is minus 2. So if oxygen is minus 2, what does the nitrogen have to be to make the charge of the entire ion minus 1? Plus 5? Yes. There's 3 oxygens, so 3 minus 2's is minus 6. That means the nitrogen has got to be plus 5 in order to make the, the ion minus 1. Do you get it? Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay. Go ahead. We're not going to get into the dynamics of it right now. We just need to assign charges. We will when we draw Lewis dot structures in chapter 8, but for now, just assign the charges. Okay. So, guys, what about something like... Let's just keep it fairly simple. KMNO4, potassium permanganate. Assign the charges. Do it in your notes. Is permanganate one of the ions you were supposed to have memorized? You know the thing that's nice is even if you didn't, you know the charge. Because if K is plus 1, the MnO4 has got to be minus 1. So guys, let's try it. So K we know is plus 1. Therefore, we know MnO4 is minus 1. Oxygen is our fixed point. That makes this minus 2. So what does the manganese have to be? Plus 7. Questions on that? You guys good? All right. So guys, now let's talk about some chemistry. There are two types of oxidation reduction reactions that you need to have a sense of. So oxidation reduction reactions tend to be single displacement reactions. Bless you. And typically what's happening is you've got a metal that begins in its elemental form and it will either be ionized by an acid or a salt. And we'll look at examples of both. So typically what you've got is an elemental metal being attacked by either an acid or a salt. So guys, we're going to do acid first. Could be, but... Okay. So guys, let's try this. Uh, zinc and hydrochloric acid. I think that if I had given you this even a half hour ago, you could have easily looked at that and said single displacement reaction. Okay, so let's, let's balance it. I'm going to give myself a little more room. I'm going to move it over. So zinc, hydrochloric acid. The zinc hooks up with the chloride. And please don't forget that hydrogen is diatomic. Then, guys, to balance it, simply all we've got to do is that. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we are going to figure out who is being oxidized and who's being reduced in this reaction. 
So guys, to do that, we've got to assign oxidation numbers to these substances. So zinc is in its elemental form. This is zinc. Its oxidation number is zero. That was rule number one. Elements in their elemental form have an oxidation number of zero. Now guys, what about hydrogen and chlorine? Plus one, minus one? Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Now let's look at zinc chloride. Assigning oxidation numbers to this, is it okay if we just say zinc is minus or plus two and chlorine is minus one? Is that okay? Then guys, what about H2? This is the elemental form of hydrogen and its oxidation number is zero. All of the diatomics in their diatomic elemental forms have oxidation numbers of zero. Now guys, what we've got to do is we've got to figure out who changed. So as you compare left to right, I see it, Catherine, hold on. As you compare left to right, whose charges changed? Well, zinc started at zero and went to plus two. It changed. Let's connect them. Then guys, what about chloride? Stayed the same. Guess what that makes chloride? Spectator. Spectator. Now guys, what about hydrogen? Hydrogen went from its plus one form to its elemental form with a charge of zero. So now guys, let's talk about how we talk about this intelligently. So first of all, let's trace the electrons. Guys, zinc went from zero to plus two. So zinc lost how many electrons? Two. So with zinc, we had the loss of two electrons. Good, and that was my next question. So guys, if zinc lost two electrons, what happened to zinc? Oxidation. So guys, this is the oxidative process. Now what happened to hydrogen? Well, hydrogen gained one electron. It went from plus one to zero. So what happened to the other electron that zinc lost? There's two of them. So guys, there's two hydrogens. Each one gained one electron. So here we had the gaining of two electrons, one to each hydrogen, and this is our reductive process. Now guys, what if we gain more electrons than we lose or lose more electrons than we gain? Then you didn't balance the equation right. You're gonna find out in chapter 20, there is a law of conservation of electrons. You can't lose electrons in redox processes. They've gotta go somewhere, and if the gains and losses don't balance, you balance the equation wrong. You good? Please, Ashley. Yeah, so for, for right now, they will always be single displacement reactions. When we get into chapter 20, this gets really crazy. But for now, they'll just be single displacement. Mm -hmm. So once you find out that Absolutely. The thing that you've got to be careful of is make sure that you're not getting confused by your spectators. But other than that, for sure. Yep. You guys good? Go ahead. Oh, Catherine, you've been waiting. Go ahead. I wasn't apologizing. I was just stating the fact. Go ahead. Go ahead. It is, but by definition, in order for our predictive structures to work with charges, we understand that for hydrogen and the rest of the diatomics, they are understood to be at an oxidation number of zero. Certainly they're still bonding, but we understand that to still be their elemental form. We'll talk more about why this is true when we get into thermochemistry, because the elemental form is understood to be the lowest energy form, and the lowest energy form for hydrogen is H2. 
2. And that form, regardless of what it looks like, is always assigned an oxidation number of 0. Mm -hmm. It's still 0. Yep. Uh -huh. And the rest of the diatomics. Okay, guys, so we're going to do one more. We're going to talk about oxidation by a salt. So let's do this. So iron reacting with copper to sulfate. So guys, single displacement reaction. We get C or FeSO4 and Cu. So now, guys, let's figure out our oxidation states. Iron is zero. Now, SO4, this ion is minus two. So that means copper's got to be plus two. We know that oxygen is minus two. So what does the sulfur have to be? Six. Plus six. Then, guys, similarly, now, this is still minus 2, which can only be explained by plus 6 and minus 2. This is plus 2, and now copper is 0. Now, guys, check this out. We can have an interesting conversation. Did the sulfates change? No, their oxidation number stayed in place. They stayed intact. Sulfate's a spectator. So now, guys, let's just write this the way you'll write it on the test. Let's write the net ionic equation. So it goes iron plus copper plus 2 yields iron plus 2 plus copper. That's the way we would represent this. Now, guys, let me ask you a question, some questions. Answer these in your notes. Here's your three questions. Question number one, how many electrons are being exchanged? Question number two, what substance is being oxidized? Question number three, what substance is being reduced? Do it in your notes. Is okay? Okay, so let's go over this. How many electrons are being exchanged? Two. Two. Guys, listen carefully. Two electrons are being exchanged. Now let's talk about oxidation. Oxidation is the losing of electrons. When something loses electrons, its charge goes up. So whose charge went up? Iron. Iron went from zero to plus two. So the answer to which substance was oxidized is iron. Now, the next and last question is, which substance is being reduced? Copper. The answer is not copper. Copper is not being reduced. Copper ion is being reduced. Guys, this, let's make sure you're clear on this. Guys, this and this are not the same thing. What is this? What does it look like? Yeah, this is copper swimming around in water. This is dissolved copper ion. What is this? It's a penny, right? Guys, these are not the same things. To call both of these copper is completely inappropriate because this is not copper. This doesn't be, copper doesn't dissolve in water. You put a penny in water and it will be there for decades. Copper does not dissolve in water. 
copper ion dissolves in water. So guys, understand that to say that copper is being reduced is completely wrong. It's not even close. It sounds close because copper and copper ion seem like the same thing, but it's radically not. Copper ion is being reduced and it is being reduced to elemental copper. Do you see the distinction? Okay. All right. So guys, with all of that said, let's do questions and then wrap this up. Go ahead. Never. No, no. So the understanding is that if it's aqueous, it's got a charge and putting both is redundant. Yep. Yeah, no, no. Guys, this is it. I think that if you dig in right now, you should be fine. Let's get our homework done.